Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SAM Society. My name is Leah Genovese and I'm a member of the lecture committee. Um, among the many of you tonight, we have a guest who has flown in from Vietnam. If you think your journey from Ari or from Onut was bad, <laughs> spare thought for Professor Massimo Sarti, who is the hydrology expert for the Marak Wu UNESCO dossier. Professor Sarti, benvenuto. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I will give a few brief details about events at the SAM Society in the next few weeks. On Thursday, the 5th of September, 7 p.m., a talk by the Israeli sociologist and photographer Daphne Nivo on a journey through Papua New Guinea. Her book on the topic will be on sale on the night at a discounted price. On Thursday, the 19th of September, again at 7 p.m., a talk by Paul Bromberg, who is a current co-editor of the Siam Society's journal. Of course, we have the other editor here, Ajahn Chris Baker. Ajahn Paul will present a talk on Thai silver and near lower, following the publication of his book on the topic. Another event on which we are working, it's work in progress, but I can tell you the date. It's Saturday, 21st of September, starting around 2.30 p.m., and it is a celebration for 70 years of diplomatic relations between Thailand and the Philippines. So that is also a date for your diaries. Tonight's topic centers on Merak U, capital city of the First Kingdom of Arakan in Myanmar, located at the junction of the Deltaic Plain and the Arakanese Mountains. The site boasts an abundance of natural features, hills, waterways, and marshes, as well as man-made stone structures like religious monuments and fortified temples. Merak-U has been on UNESCO's tentative list since 1996. Uh, if you think that Myanmar had its first site inscribed on the World Heritage List in 2014, with the Pew cities. And in July this year, I was in Baku, in Azerbaijan, where Bagan was also inscribed on the list of World Heritage Cities. So if the Merak U dossier satisfies all the criteria, then that will be the third site for Myanmar. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Jacques Leider, is an historian of Southeast Asia whose research work has focused on the early modern history of Arakan, Rakhine State, and Myanmar. He holds a doctorate for a thesis on the history of the Merak U Kingdom. Before joining the Ecole Francaise d'Extreme Orient, he taught at Chulalongkorn University in the late 1990s. Dr. Lida is the current head of the FAO offices in Yangon and Bangkok. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jacques Leider. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, thank you very much, Leah, for this presentation. It's with great, great pleasure that I accepted the invitation of the Siam Society to give a talk on Rau, better like this, and the kingdom of Arakan or Rakhine. Rau was the capital of a Buddhist kingdom which flourished between the 15th and the 17th century in western Myanmar and the Bay of Bengal. It was like Ayutthaya both of the land and the sea, which means that its rise and its power were due to the agricultural resources of a rice-consuming economy, as well as to its maritime connections involving commercial exchange in the Indian Ocean and maritime Southeast Asia. It's also an honor to be here today because I can speak in front of an eminent audience as a researcher with the Ecole Française d'Extrême Orient, the French Institute of Asian Studies, now for 18 years, I think I stand in a tradition of French field research in Southeast Asia, which has nourished a deep connection with Thailand, 
with the Siam Society and also with Bangkok at large. Let me say that this evening's presentation is a report from an emerging field, not the state-of-the-art summary of well-assessed academic knowledge that you might expect. Though I'm not completely unhappy about that because I like the intense perfume of questions much more than the passing smell of answers that are seemingly written in stone. Now, new evidence and new ideas have come up about Mrawu with the preparation of the dossier for the UNESCO, for Mrawu's candidacy for UNESCO's World Heritage Site. Now, I praise the merits of some of my colleagues like Bob Hudson, some of you might know, an archaeologist, or Massimo Saki, who is here today, a specialist on hydrology, from whom I have been learning a lot, though I've been working on Mrawu for a fairly long time. Now, having said that, I would like to thank everyone here in the audience today. I look very much forward to your questions later on. My talk has three parts. The first one is Mrawu, what we see. The second one is Mrawu, what we know. And the last one, Mrawu, what we want to understand. And I will start with photos because I would like to dip you a little bit in the mystery of Mrawu is, which is suggested by many of the touristy photos that we have seen uh, over the last years uh, in the media. Now I want to plunge you into this atmosphere of the natural setting, the ruins, the landscape, because I think it helps our mind to fix on this extraordinary site. Now one reason is that just like Ayutthaya, or other great cities of the past in Myanmar, in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, there's this huge gap between what little we know and the material legacy, uh, the, what little we see, the material legacy, and the setting of the events in the past that we always struggle to reconstruct. Now, Mrawu is very much a place of, of mystery, and I will have to appeal to, your, to the power of your imagination to see things of which often not very much remains. Now, for a sense of orientation, I think it's good to start with maps, but before saying that, let me say that there are a number of names circulating, Arakan and Rukhain. I am going to use both. Alternately, they are synonymous without any particular uh, intention. Now, now, what we see is an ancient city in ruins. It's also a modern provincial town of something like 30,000, 40,000 people. It's a place like Ayutthaya, in a way, because Buddhist sites are all spread over the city. There are walls, there are rivers, there are moats that remember us of this old history. It's a heritage site, it's a site of memories. Now, take a look at the topographical map here, the green map, where you can see Rakhine, Arakan, the western coast of Myanmar, kind of shut off, isolated by mountain ridges that run in a north-southern direction. The yellow card here on the left side is the administrative uh, map of Rakhine State in the Union of Myanmar. And the map on the right side is a 16th century map of the great empire, Burmese empire of King Beyinong, Burinong for the Thais, where in green is represented the stretch of Rakhine. And there you can see the kingdom of which I am talking today was nearly double the size of what, the Rakhine, of what Rakhine state is today, stretching deeply into southern Bengal covering part of the southeast of Bengal and even beyond lower part of Myanmar in those days. Mrawu, the capital, is where you can spot now the red circles on these three maps because Mrawu is not mentioned on all these maps. So this is where we will focus our attention on. I am also like to point to the city of Chittagong, you see on the green map on top. Chittagong is today the second biggest city in Bangladesh. 300 years ago, it was part of the Rakhine Arakanese Empire. So the whole coastline, that is what we are talking about, from north to south, from southeast Bengal down to lower Myanmar. Now take a look at this fabulous view from space. 
You see Mrau lies at the end of a ridge of hills in this landscape very much dominated by rivers. It's very typical Southeast Asian. The plains where rice fields, uh, where, where the, the fertile lands allowed the production of rice. You have these rivers that reach deep into the land. On the left side, the Mayu River, centrally the the Caladan River, the Mayu River, the Caladan River, and here the Limro Valley. In these valleys here, in this area, you find since the first millennium, Indianized urban sites. It's no loss of time to say a few words about geography, in particular about the climate. This is the Northeast Bay of Bengal. This is an area where we find some of the highest rainfall in the world, which means that while people will circulate on the rivers, transport will still be hampered along the coast and on these rivers during the monsoon season. That has obvious political implications as well when it comes to ruling the country, when it comes to warfare, because simply you cannot, you cannot move, you cannot circulate in this, in this site, in this type of geography. You see also the importance on this, on this picture of the mountains, of the ridges that run no, in a mostly uh, north-southerly direction. It's isolating this area, it's also in a way protecting it from its neighbors. Now here a few photos just to give a view on the landscape. The photo here, this shows the mouth of the Calada River uh, and at the back the Bay of Bengal. Here is a view on the height of the middle part of the Calada Valley. This is a view during the dry season of the Limro Valley, in fact, very close to Mrau'u. This is how Rakhine looks when you're moving up the plains in Rakhine State. This is during the rain season. You see the fertility of the land, it's all green, and the rivers that are so typical for the landscape of Rakhine. Now, I'm going to show you a number of those sites that have attracted most attention for those interested in culture. Mrau is very much like, I mentioned Ayutthaya several times, or Sukhothai, or Pagan, a place uh, of Buddhist religious sites. This was a Buddhist kingdom, and some of these sites are obviously important for the local people, but also important in a wider context. Now, this lecture today, this talk of this evening, is also connected to my collaboration uh, with the preparation of UNESCO dossier. So some new research work is going on, and obviously there's a focus on the history, on the background of places like this. This is the Shitaung Pagoda that was built in the mid-16th century and which is attributed to King Myanba, the first great king who leads the expansion of the, the territorial expansion of the kingdom. Now, this is a very original temple, but it was largely rebuilt since the end of the 19th century when a, uh, a board of trustees at the end of the 19th century with some support of the colonial, British colonial rulers was going to rebuild it. It was largely a heap of stone and bricks. So the way it looks today might not be fully accurate. We simply, we do not know how this site looked previously. I will not show many pictures from inside this temple. This should be rather an invitation to you to visit Mrau'u one day. Uh, but try to use some of these spectacular photos that are now possible because we have drones that can fly over the sites and to get this general impression that until now we, we never had. Actually, we didn't have and I didn't have the chance to see uh, perspectives myself since many years ago that I went first time to uh, Mrau'u. So just giving some of these explanations to highlight these sites. But these are some of the really spectacular sites that you see of a quite 
original type of architecture that you wouldn't see uh, in other places. Obviously, what's particular about Mrau, some may already have noted this, is the use of stone, while obviously it's brick that is much more prevalent in Southeast Asian architecture. Here's another series of the same temple, in a more horizontal view, the Shitang Temple, mid-16th century, and with a few other pictures, I try to highlight in particular how these places looked when I could visit them the first time. Take this picture with the whitewashed building and the slightly older type of uh, corrugated sheets here on the temple in comparison with this more modern version. The cement color here against the whitewashing here, just to see a little bit how even in the latest years, Dumrau has remained kind of a, a mysterious site, visited by very few uh, tourists, has been already changing. And this change is going on also in other places. Now, when you visit the place, you get up in the morning, you have the mist hanging over the city. I pointed out here the names of some of these places, the Shitong here, uh, seen from another perspective, the Andoteng, the Radenabung, and the Lemiena, uh, some of the most uh, popular places visited. Now, what you see here is one of the plains north of the palace site, the former palace site, of which basically nothing beyond the walls is left. But what's interesting in this photo you see, it's a view towards the east, where you can see, uh, sorry, a view towards the west, from east to west, where you see the plain, once again, of the Caladin, and you see here these mountain ridges, which encircle, which inbox this, this place, which is the natural landscape that contributed to the building, to the construction of a defensive site for this capital city that lasted no less than 350 years. There are rarely cities found that have such great continuity. And this is definitely uh, one reason is this uh, uh, use of the natural landscape together with man-made works. Now one temple here, just another view, but during a different season, you see you get uh, 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 very different impressions again here, the Radhanabo temple built in the early 17th century, and you might already notice a kind of different type of architecture at the distance of about 100 years. I will get back to this because it opens some space for interpretations. Again, let me tell you, it's not that I will hide any secrets about this site, but simply there is nearly no academic, no art historical work about these sites. Here another view about this valley. Here you see the Shitong here is hidden at the back. And some of these sites, I won't further comment, but it gives you a little bit like illustrating the point, some of these points that I have already uh, been making now. Now, this is the type of uh, pagoda that you see in the 17th and 18th century. This is the Jinama Aung built in the mid 17th century by King Sandatu de Mayasa one of the longest living kings of the Mrau uh, dynasty. Here you, we see also recent work that has been done. A lot of cement also here heaped up on the restoration of this pagoda. And it gives you a little bit of an idea how this provincial town of something like 30,000 people looks today with lots of the quarters hidden under the greenery of the trees. Now this is one of the particular temples uh, in Mrau that have drawn quite a lot of attention and led to the early speculation that this temple could serve as fortresses. I definitely don't think so. But still there's a lot to be, a research to be done to provide an interpretation of such uh, buildings. Here you have a photo that I took 20 years ago and here with recent stabilization work uh, on the, the basis of the, where this temple uh, was uh, constructed. This is the Dokhan Teng temple, and Teng means Sima. The Sima is actually located here at the end, that means an ordination hall. But the interior here is a, a, a long passageway of galleries where you see statues, where you see representation of princesses uh, that pay homage to Buddha statues. And there's one major Buddha statue under the top stupa here, 
and there's a staircase inside leading up to it. There won't be any photos, but the photo announcing this talk today is taken from within this uh, temple. And this temple is a late 16th century uh, construction, uh, and uh, here you see also this uh, uh, efforts to, to cover it, to protect it from, from water here that might not look very nice. It won't probably win a contest of beauty, this temple, but extremely original and leaves a lot of spaces for interpretation. Now this is a place that I saw in this state in the late 90s when I visited Mrawu. There was not, and there is still, no single line, no article, no publication on this site. This is how it showed itself to a visitor who arrived in 1999 when it had been, when the vegetation had been uh, taken off by the Department of Archaeology for an official visit. This is the Kotaung Temple. Kotaung means 90,000 uh, Buddha statues, and it kind of remembers a little bit, make you think maybe distantly of Borobudur. Supposedly it was constructed by King Mintikai, who reigned only two years, so it might actually be, uh, the construction might have needed need a little bit longer than, than this. Anyway, what, we, what I saw there 20 years ago, you would not see it like that today, because when today you go there, it has been fully, not fully, but largely reconstructed. But this is, you know, the place that most people, it, it, in the way that most people discover it right today. You know? So nobody, this kind of photo that I showed, you know, this is not a photo that you could easily track on the internet because there were extremely few visitors there. And just think about it, in the colonial period, this site was not even known. It was totally overgrown uh, by uh, vegetation. Now this is here a drone view that might give you an idea about the whole compound. You've seen that in the previous picture, the main super had not yet been rebuilt. And inside here, there are long galleries uh, like this, where you see Buddha statues on the left and the right. And here, that might not be very clear, but the, the walls are all full with representations of two, three stones that show also Buddha statues. So the name 90,000 Buddhas, Kothang in Burmese, uh, actually is very much true. Mrao is a city of Buddhist sites, but there's also one site that has left that recalls the presence of many, many foreigners that were involved in the history of this kingdom. And this is the remains of a mosque here. You see that is a moment uh, where it was largely overgrown by vegetation, but not in the worst condition. It allowed to take photos like this. This is, I myself visited a few months, had a chance to visit a few months ago. We were fighting our way to the vegetation. It's a, ru it's a site in ruins like many other places. It's connected to the memory of what would reputedly be the first uh, mosque, the Santikan Mosque that is well remembered and ascribed to the 15th century and early presence of a Muslim community. But this is something that I, I find slightly doubtful because of the situation where the city, where this mosque, where the ruins are outside. And it's really, as you can see from these photos, really very small, while we would rather imagine bigger sites. There were three churches, Catholic Portuguese churches in Mrau, and we still struggle to point to one site where the remains of this church could have been, possibly outside of the city, but uh, for the moment, uh, waiting for more archaeological evidence, uh, we still have no, no hard evidence on this, on any place like this. Now our colleagues from Nanjing University, uh, uh, from Southeast University in Nanjing, sorry, uh, have come up with uh, also quite more distant, also drone taken photos of the city. And I would like to comment a little bit on this. Here we have, so, Mrau City, and in the middle, you have this side of the former palace with the little archaeological museum here in the middle. You won't see much photos from this place because there isn't much to be shown. Let me recall that at the end of the 18th century, uh, there's somebody who visited the site who came back to Calcutta and reports that 
the king was living in a bamboo hut on this place. Nothing was left already 200 years ago of the palace that was on top of this site here. This is a view of one of the palace walls. So the upper palace wall on, on sorry, on here. This is what you see on this photo here of the palace wall. There are many, many walls, and I show a few pictures on these, within the city and on the outer part that made this into a defensive, protective system for the whole city. But the palace site itself was obviously already vastly impressive. But there's nothing left on what was the palace itself. Now you have some of these gates that, that are still existing that also have partly been stabilized now to make them, to make them safe that are very clearly recognizable and give an idea of this protective site. And then we have the rivers, the importance of the river. Here we see the Elysee Creek. And you might see here a strangely different color here and there. And the reason is that this city is 70, 80 kilometers away from the sea. It's still feeling the tide and getting the effect of the tide. That means that in the morning, you are standing on this bridge here, near the market, or here or there, and you're standing there and you see the, the river running in a different direction what you saw in the morning, and strongly. I mean, it's very perceptible. I mean, this is, there are some really remarkable aspects as to this. So I won't go into trying to emulate Professor Sartion explaining hydrology, but it's obvious that water is a need, water can be a threat, and water should be, in such cases, well managed. And it was well managed, because some of the canals, some of what looks like the river, were actually canals, man-made canals. Here we have another visible, the Pansy Creek, which runs down, sorry, I have to be careful not to say here. And you see all over the city here, you will see tanks, water reservoirs, which are typical for the landscape here in Mrau and beyond uh, Mrau. And that all made sense, and when we are reaching out to other vistas of the city, here the southern part, here we see two sides of lakes. This is a view towards the south, the Enoma Lake and the Lesse Lake. Water reservoirs were there to provide water to the city, and the Enoma Lake here is still fulfilling this function today for the residents of the city. You see here also the earthen embankments, which in certain places were reinforced with stone, sorry, with stone walls. And I, again, I draw your attention here to the plain in the background. This is the Lemro Valley, and then these hill ridges here that are natural protection. And now what recently has been discovered is that along these hills here, there were trenches that were built that definitely allowed the circulation along these ridges. Definitely is still open for some bigger interpretations, but uh, already quite clearly uh, man-made as well and contributing to uh, man these sites because some places here on top of the hills are called fortresses. And in, in the sites, we don't fall much in terms of ruins at the moment, but they are still called forts and were definitely manned by garrisons. Now, this is, a, I think, a fabulous view into a different direction here, looking from the east, from the west towards the east, from Muedong, Silver Hill. And there you see the steep hills of the steep mountain ridges of the Arakan Yoma. It's behind, there's Myanmar. It's quite clear when you talk about this mountain range shut off Rakhine from the Irrawaddy Valley. This is really what it does. You see, when the British conquered Rakhine in 1824-25, one of the first questions is, can we invade Myanmar from this side? Can our elephants drag artillery beyond these, these mountains? That was the the standing question very early already. And definitely there's a problem to get elephants beyond these mountains. Now this is a place of ruins, this is a place of Buddhist, territory, of Buddhist sites, this is a place of a living city, and there's so much more observations that I could have included here. I would like to draw your attention to ceramics because so many of you are interested in these, in these topics, I think, and while walking throughout uh, Mrau'u, at the kiln sites, you can easily find this type of glaze charts all over the place. Don't even need to go to the archaeological museum. 
This is a photo that I took at the Kotong Temple many years ago, the remains of glazed floor tiles here. Very beautiful in, indeed. And one of the more better known places where, they are, where such glazed tiles are still in situ is the Lombrambra Stupa in early 16th uh, GD. Now this is one of the fine maps that uh, our Nanjing colleagues have, have been drawing, trying to summarize what we know at present, what we can see. Now let me talk again about the river system here, where you see the Mazi here, uh, running over into rivers that take them to the Kala Dam, but this one is go coming down here. I'll ask Professor Sati to correct me if I say talk nonsense. Um, here we see those areas, low-lying areas, that could be either flooded or simply because of the rainfall would be underwater here. And then here we have the Elysee Creek running from the Lemuro River down to the Caledon River. And here the lakes that I had previously showing you on one of the photos that gives you an idea. And obviously your, your eyes were fixated right away on the middle, on the palace side. And some of the city, or most part of the city, as we find it today, is here on the uh, western side of the old side. The earlier photos that I took and that I showed you are all from this plain in the northern part of the city. So to help you to give and provide some orientation here. Now, Mrao, what we see, some impressions, now Mrao, what we know. Now, it's the history, the academic that will talk to you. It's the history of the rise and fall of a kingdom. And it's a kingdom in the Bay of Bengal. It's a Southeast Asian kingdom. There's much to be said. This is a Southeast Asian kingdom. This is part of so many uh, uh, aspects that connect it to Myanmar. But on the other hand, it's a kingdom that was successful because it was fully integrated into the life, the social and economic lives of the Bay of Bengal, which means India, which means Bengal. It's a history of a military specialization, and the side that I have already introduced to you has been pointing the defensive works, the exploration, the use of the natural landscape, but then also something where we have nothing left which was, in Rao's history, the role of the navy. Now, neither Siam, nor Myanmar, nor other Southeast Asian kings are famous for a navy, but Rakhine's success was built on its navy of many hundreds and of many thousands of boats. But nothing of this is left in terms of knowing how these boats were built. And I can just like, give you a little bit of an impression about this. Obviously, it's also a history of hydrological management, and this is what we have been learning over the last months by, by preparing the dossier, and it's something that I've been looking forward myself for a very long time. Now, you want to write the history of a Southeast Asian kingdom, you need sources. And the sources for Rakhine are those like for other kingdoms, it's manuscripts, written on palm leaf manuscripts, some of these written often quite lately because it seems that people are writing their history when the kingdom is dying, when it's disappearing. And this is a little bit what had happened. Even British administrators asking local Rakhine uh, wise men, please write a national history, as they would call it in the late 19th century. Now here the photo of a monk, Santa Mala, who in 1931-1932 compiles many of these sources that we have. Here, by the way, also a photo on a re-edition of one of these chronicles taken from the Kotao Pagoda, now also very popular with local people. It's on this that since the early 1990s, some research has been done, exploring also Portuguese sources, the famous travels of Sebastian Manrique, leading to some work in Portuguese, the Dutch account of a medical doctor, Wouter Schouten, who was with the Dutch East India Company, other Portuguese who was in some academic work that came out, lately a work on a famous Bengali poet who was living in Mrau at the court, uh, Alaol, and one of my colleagues, Thibaut Dubert, uh, having, from, uh, having written a PhD on, on this. So there's some work that has been done. It's still open for much work, uh, much more. Now, this emerging independent kingdom, it starts in 1430. Now, is there any hard evidence? There isn't any, but this is the one day that we find in the Sotis, 792 Dekara era, which is 1480, uh, 1430 AD. And what we see is, 
This is a small kingdom in a kind of a lost area, corner of the world, that is stepping out of the shadow of Bengal, because this is the time that the Sultanate of Bengal is really in its most flourishing period. And we also know this is a kingdom that emerges, that is stepping out of, out of the shadow of the kingdom of Inwa, Myanmar kingdom in central Myanmar, and Pegu, Pegu or Hong Sawadi in uh, lower Myanmar. And why we know that, it's because during the earlier period, which is a very obscure period, with a, with a capital which, of which barely anything is left today. It's, today, it's just a big village with a few ruins, but very little, but what we call liberal period. But what we know is that in the early 15th century, the Myanmar, the Mon, these neighboring kingdoms, they were interfering there. Like they're setting up kings and lords there, and so on. They got involved there. There's some epigraphic evidence on this. There's some legends, but it's still a kind of troubled history. <coughs> now, what we see is that this smallish kingdom that is rising there in Rau, it was impacted by the Sultanate of Bengal because the early coins and titles of the kings definitely point to some cultural influence on that side. But rather than talking like what we see today in political propaganda in kind of nationalistic discourses referring to Bengal and the Muslim world, it's much more interesting to look into the local history, the history of Chittagong, because the history of East Bengal is very often a different history from the rest of Bengal. And it's interesting here to look at the local history of this port. You see, when the Portuguese come in the early 16th century, they say, this is Porto Grande. Porto Grande, the big port, the most important port in that region. And that was, Chittagong was, had that role already for nearly over a hundred years. Since the 14th century, we see a presence here of a Muslim ruler. Now, the first hundred years, 1430 up to 1530, it's a phase of expansion. It's a period where these kings, the first kings of Mrau'u, are consolidating the territory along the coast that I've showed you on the map. It's all down south, what is Rakhine State today. That is what they're trying to knit together into one homogenous uh, political t uh, territory that they can control, what I call consolidation. And early on, and that's very interesting, they have some territorial arrangement with Iwa. We hear about a meeting between these two kings and saying, the watershed of the mountain ridge will be our border. That's quite interesting. We rarely have such kind of evidence on a border because this is still the border today. It's an internal border, but it's still the border uh, within the country today. So there are a number of favorable factors that play a role. Rejection of foreign wall, I'm talking about stepping out of the shadow of your neighbors, definitely joining trade networks. Trade networks. You have in 14, dated 1495, 1495, you have a Persian inscription in the Archaeological Museum of Mrau. This is the most, eastmost, how should I say, the most easternmost <laughs> Persian inscription in the world, which is in the Archaeological Museum in Rau'u. It's very difficult to read, even for specialists of Persian. By now, it has been transcribed, translated, and published. Luckily, it's a bilingual. The Rakhine version is much more difficult even to read, but which is some kind of evidence, because it is a, a permit by the king for a trader. So that's quite interesting, and there's a long list of witnesses there as well. You have these bits and pieces you know, that give you evidence. Now, it benefits definitely from some from the marginal isolated situation and because there are these buffer zones, these natural uh, buffer zones that exist north and south of the era. And it's also interesting, the first poem mentioned in Myanmar literature, in Burmese literature, the Mientenmi Ejian, is also ascribed to this kingdom of Mrau'u in the 15th century. Now, I think that probably in an early time, there were some earthen works already had been constructed to protect the city. I think this is a fabulous photo that shows you how in this valley, and obviously this is all covered by shrubs and, and trees nowadays, but you see clearly these lines of these man-made earthen works that protected the city. Here it's again to the eastern side of the city. You have rice fields on both sides. Obviously today this defensive function doesn't exist anymore, but with a little help of your imagination, I think you can see that these are uh, 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 ramparts, these are earth ramparts, and that might have been easily flooded here uh, during the rainy season or the, thanks to hydrological work. You see here 
the canal passing, the river passing along this place. Yeah. Now then we enter in the really active period of what I call the Rakhine warrior kings over the next century. And phase one is the one king that I mentioned earlier on, uh, King Mirmba, who he really attempts then to expand the territorial control towards the west, and then he reads into some resistance. Uh, the Chakma people, this is still an ethnic group that lives in southeast Bengal, uh, Bangladesh today. These Chakma people appear and they had a small kingdom at the time of which we know very, very little, but these Chakma were constantly attacking Rahu at the time and the Rahu kings had a hard time to fight against them. But the real enemy, the real uh, rivals in the area on the sea are the Portuguese. Now you might be surprised because nobody ever told you about Portuguese being very active there, but actually research done since the 1980s has shown that the Portuguese were extremely numerous in the Chittagong area. They had fixed settlements there and they played a huge important role in the Mrao Kingdom. And it's after to commemorate the military success of uh, a battle against the Sorry, this is not what I wanted to do. The Shitang Pagoda that was built in commemoration of this success against the Portuguese. Now here I integrated a, 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 a sculpture, a relief sculpture of a Rakhine warrior with the typical round shields, the dying, and the sword. And as King Miemba is reputedly represented in the Shitang Pagoda, sorry, in the Shitang Pagoda here, at the corner of one of the galleries with his consorts and queens on his right and on his left, and reputedly one queen being from Bengal. Uh, it's worthwhile here to point to this because there aren't that many representations of Rakhine kings uh, anywhere. Now coming back to the political situation, Arakan gets drawn into regional political rivalries and it's, it seems to be like the king of Tripura, the Rakhine king, the sultan of Bengal, the governors of Chittagong, they're all struggling how to control the trade in the northern Bay of Bengal. So Chittagong is really the prize to be won. And the city itself, needed more and more fortifications and protection for the simple reason that some enemies, some uh, neighbors, in uh, said neighbors might actually be interested to gain a control over Mrawu because now after a century it gains some kind of reputation of its own. And it comes to King Miemba and to one of his sons, King Miempelong, uh, that he have to face two attempts of Myanmar kings to conquer Rakhine. And no less than Myanmar Shwedi or Tobian Shwedi, in 1545, the builder of the first great Myanmar empire in the 16th century. And that obviously the king that is well known in Thailand, Burinaung, Beyinau, who the year, actually in the year that he himself passed away, they tried to attack Rakhine. And that made actually the fortifications and the expanded fortifications, the stone fortifications of Mrawu, uh, very meaningful. Now, I said I'm going to show you at least one picture. Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, one picture of the remains of walls within the city, in inside and outside the city. Here, the one of the palace basement, I think it's quite interesting because definitely this must be the 16th century remains of the 16th century basement of the walls, quite different from the odd looking one that I showed you in one of the first slides here. So this is the top part of the palace side. You see on top there's nothing left. Here, another photo of one of the gates towards the south. Here, definitely a construction that belonged to hydrological works at the Crown Le Dong, north, south, sorry, uh, north east part of the city. Here, an inner wall that's connected to what is called a royal granary. There are many sites labeled royal granaries, but basically there's nothing left in terms of construction here. And then you see here also partly reconstructed, which sometimes really makes sense. As you can see, this, they kept some of the remains of the walls that were really, after so many centuries, in very uh, bad shape. 
Now, as I said previously, the prize here was really Chittagong, the port of Chittagong. Now, there is no one major conquest of this. There's no one moment in the chronicle they say, now they conquered Chittagong. That was not the case. It looks rather like a soft taking over of Chittagong, maybe of leaving in place a, a governor and an existing governor. And what was, how was that possible? Now, we need make to step into Indian history. In 1576, the Mughals are conquering Bengal. It means the end of the Sultanate of Bengal. Now, when you are looking and you Google Mughal, Mughal Empire, and you look for a map, you generally see a map in many colors for the simple reason that the Mughal Empire is something that is enlarging itself by centuries and over centuries. No. And uh, definitely, this is one of the major steps towards the east, the conquest of Bengal. But this didn't mean all of Bengal. It, mean, it meant mainly what you see today on a map as West Bengal, which is the Indian Bengal, not what you would see as Bangladesh of today. All this part of eastern Bengal suffered like multiple territorial partition. This is a, a, a phase within the history of Bengal and Bangladesh, which is the phase of the Barubuyas. That means like local lords, Hindu and Muslim lords, are taking over various parts of the landscape. And this is the, the area in which the Rakhine kings will invest, of conquering Chittagong and taking over large control of southeast Bengal. And Chittagong is going to be a major source of income, a major economic pillar for this kingdom due to land taxes, direct trade where the court gets involved, but also controlling this trade network. But still, the Portuguese are still there. They also want to play a role, and so there's this kind of rivalry. And the point to which these Portuguese are important is shown not only the memorizing this temple, but also the very name of this king. Palaung is the same word, local pronunciation of Farang. Palaung is Farang. So this king was called King Farang in a way, foreigner king, for the reason that apparently he was born on the day there was another event connected to Portuguese that his father was commemorating. There was some reason to it, which is quite, I think, quite fascinating. That shows how much the involvement of these Portuguese in this area. Portuguese become a pillar of naval strength, but from Portuguese sources we also know that when the Sultanate of Bengal disappeared that many of those soldiers were running away among them Patan soldiers, that means Muslims originally from Afghanistan. Yeah. So these also moved into and, and, and it is also like, you see, like collective teamwork to build up and to sustain, to support this uh, kingdom. Sorry, I, I made a little bit of an elaborate uh, PowerPoint, and now it's, it doesn't go the way that I want. <laughs> um, well, let, let's try like this. I'm moving into phase two of Rakhine Warrior Kings, and that's where I want it to be. Um, one more click, and we come to another king, and I hope I can put in some color. This man's name is... Raza, Gri, Gri means big, so Mie means also Ma, or Mie means king. It so means something like great king king. And he was a great king king, because this was the most military active and powerful warrior king in Rakhine history. Because he was born and he ruled during the period when the Myanmar Empire was getting weaker and weaker. You know, the successor of the famous king Burinaung, Biyinaung, Nanda Biyan was totally obsessed by conquering Ayutthaya and he couldn't make it. He couldn't get enough men together. The armies were never big enough. He didn't make it like his father. So in that context of weakening Myanmar kingdom, one of the minor kings invites the king of Taungu, invites the Rakhine king. Okay, let's put an end to it. He invites the Rakhine king to conquer Pegu. And after a siege in 1599, the city is falling. There were also Portuguese there. They're definitely, there were always Portuguese. There were Portuguese in Siam, there were Portuguese in Myanmar, there were Portuguese in Rakhine. And then, well, the triumph is that you can take away all these Mon people now, you can take away the court, you can take all the valuables. 
Sorry for the people from Ayutthaya, they were a little bit late to arrive there. They didn't get that much, uh, those people who were involved in the first place. Because here Siam gets very much involved just a few years later. We have battles where the Rakhine Navy is trying to fight it out uh, and to cut short to Ayutthayan uh, soldiers. The Rakhine kings were never great administrators. They were great conquerors, but not great administrators. They were generally delegating or leaving governors in place. So in this case, they chose one of their captains who had a 20-year career with the Rakhine king, and they said, we appoint you governor of Syria. Today it's pronounced Talia. The governor, they made him the governor of Talia. Now, Syria was a real prize in terms of ports. I mean, this was the most important, for 200 years, the most important port in Myanmar, before Yango took over in the 18th century. And Philippe de Brito, nonetheless, he got ideas of his own because he makes himself independent. The British colonial historians have made big fuss out of this story of de Brito's autonomous role, uh, rule in Syria. It didn't last very long because the Myanmar kingdom is gaining force again and they're just taking over it at a certain moment. But still, we believe that de Brito kept on paying taxes because the, the son of King Mrazagri paid him visit once a while and he could fleet along and putting a lot of pressure on him. So the system is, we want them to pay taxes. We don't want to rule the land. We don't want to get involved with anyone here. Just they pay tribute to our king. And the really important thing here is, as I mentioned several times now, is this navy. Now talking about this navy, you're talking about stitched boats. Hey, what's that? Yeah, that's stitch boats. Stitch, it means like you're putting holes in a plank and you're stitching the planks together. And here you have a boat. I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I come from a country where you don't have any kind of boat, uh, naval architecture. I had no clue about this. But you need to put a lot of gum in these holes. Now, what's the advantage of this kind of naval architecture? The advantage is that in stormy seas, these boats are sufficiently flexible. Now, a boat like this, and this is a photo that I took in the National Museum of Bangladesh in Dhaka, where, where one, there's still one item there, and luckily so, because it comes, gives you some idea, you know, how a boat like that looked like. It's possible to set sail. I mean, they're not rowing all the time, definitely not. You can set sail on such boats. They would be manned between 16 up to 50 men, so they could be much bigger than these, and they would probably also have on uh, the, the on the floor what you call a swivel gun. Now this item you can see in the archaeological museum in Mrau, what you call a, a swivel uh, a swivel gun. Right. So this just like a little bit to get an idea about what such a fleet could look like. This is a drawing of the Rakhine fleet lying in front of Pipli. Pipli was an important port in Orissa. <coughs> And this is, was seen really by Wouter Schouten, a Dutch doctor who was with the Dutch East India Company. He was there in Pipli when this fleet arrived. They came with thousands of slaves and they wanted to sell them. So they just threatened the locals and they say, open your markets, we want to sell our slaves. And obviously these seem to be just a few of these rowing boats. There were definitely more. And they were generally under what you call Portuguese captains, these might be Portuguese born in Asia for a century already, but we still keep on calling them Portuguese captains. Now this is what it might have looked like. And I get back to my presentation here, and I would like to talk to say a few words about a more cultural aspect, which is really kind of my own idea or theory or interpretation as you, as you want, because I think that there was also an impact of the conquest of Pegu, of Lower Myanmar, on religious architecture. Now, I showed you already this temple previously, uh, the Radhanabung, and when you look at this Radhanabung built by Mienko Maung, who is the son of this king, he was with the, inv the, the invaders in, uh, in, in Lower Myanmar, and you have this type of stupa, which looks very much like 17th century Myanmar stupas, when you know a little bit the history of religious architecture in uh, Myanmar. 
So this is a kind of idea that I have to show this, or maybe to argue about the striking contrast of religious architecture in Rau between the 16th and then the 17th century. So here we go with King Mianchamau. And King Mianchamau, his name is nothing to do with Portugal. This is the name of a tree you know, under which apparently he was born. Now, King Mianchamau, he just rules for 10 years, but he was also had to be very active because in those days, the Mughals kept on expanding further to the east, and they tried by land to attack Rakhine. First of all, we want to get this port of Chittagong. It used to be a Muslim port. We want to get it back, but they fail. They fail again and again. They conquered Tripura in those days, but they didn't make it. Rakhine then systematically were depopulating the area north of, north of Arakan up to Noakali, what is today the district of Noakali in Bangladesh, up to that area just to prevent any land invasions. There was no support, there was only jungle. Jungle 450 kilometers before you arrived in Rakhine. And the other competitor that are kind of new is the Estado da India, official Portugal, Portugal in Goa, in Western India, takes an interest in this area. And they say, shouldn't we contact and team up with these political entrepreneurs like the Brito or this guy, Sebastião Tibau, who called a whole island his own and tried to conquer Arakan. They even had a legal specialist to say that actually the Rakhine king, his heritage, it should belong to Portugal. There are very sophisticated arguments, very curious arguments about this, but there are long Portuguese texts in the Torre do Tombo in Lisbon that argued that Arakan should belong to the Portuguese king. But in the end, they tried to conquer it, but they failed, and the Dutch, the early Dutch present in the area were helpful to the Rakhine. And there was a treaty, it ended up all with a treaty, a very official treaty as published in the treaties that the Kingdom of Portugal concluded with Asian powers, no less than that. So the general picture is that Rakhine Kingdom gets into controlling Chittagong and Southeast Bengal. This is an area that in the chronicle they call Binga Sinemu, the 12 towns of Bengal. This is not a territorial control. You understand they are controlling people. They are controlling particular places. They have garrisons in place, and they have, they have their navy to send in. So you have a network of tributaries in a very, very successful way. And this is a kingdom that we call cosmopolitan. And we call it cosmopolitan because it was multi-ethnic, it was multi-religious. Uh, and what's more symbolic than coins? because coins express the sovereign power of a ruler. And this is an example of one of Mianchamang's coins, trilingual coin. You have the Rakhine site, you have the Arabic, and you have the Bengali here. And it's a message, it's a message that you're sending. I am a king for all these different communities. You have titles that talk to the people. Dhammaraja talks to a Buddhist audience, a writer's Buddhist king. Lord of the White Elephant is something that talks to both Hindus who also lived in this kingdom and to Buddhists alike. I think I don't need to elaborate. And you have Hussein Shah also adopting a name which is a typical Muslim name. And you find this in these three uh, versions. This is, I think, nothing more strongly symbolic and reaching out to a diverse uh, population. Now, we move into here in a very different phase of the history of Rakhine, and I give you the title, Lords of the Golden Palace, and I will tell you why. First, let's start with this king who was 18 years old, Diri Tudumayasa. Uh, I apologize for my Burmese pronunciation. You read it as you like, but this is how you find it in many books, Diri Tudumayasa. So this king, who became king at the age, tender age of 18 years, and he, he is really, himself, his reign is a kind of transition as we are moving from the warrior king phase into a kind of more quiet administrative phase of this kingdom. Now, he did nothing less than send his fleet and destroyed the whole Mughal navy in Dhaka. At the same time, he destroyed the city. This was quite typical for the type of warfare what I would call preemptive strikes. It's constant aggression because you want to destroy your enemy before he attacks you. And they did the same, you see, in Lower Myanmar. In 1626, naval attacks against the, uh, the still capital Pegu or Pegu, Antalya, Syria, in Lower Myanmar. 
please keep on paying your taxes. That's the message that they want to convey. But then on the other hand, Rakhine is not just a bloody warrior story. Story. The Rakhine history is also a history of Rakhine diplomacy, and I will have a few thing, things to say about that. In 1624, Diritu de Mayaza sends an embassy to Shah Jahan, the son of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. But at that time, when he sent this embassy, Shah Jahan was in revolt against his father. But Shah Jahan appreciated very much and sends a dress of honor to the Rakhine king. What was the impact? The impact was that when Shah Jahan himself became the Mughal emperor, he didn't initiate any more attempt to conquer Rakhine. Wasn't that successful diplomacy? For 30 years, the Rakhine were basically quiet on the side of the Mughals. Very successful, in a way. Now there is, you see, two years later, while Myanmar was getting stronger and more powerful, and notably expanding to the northeast, that's the time that they're ruling Chiang Mai, Rakhine sends an embassy to Ayutthaya. I don't need to explain why, you understand immediately. This is finding an ally against Myanmar. They were even sending an embassy to Chiang Mai because the Myanmar king didn't want to listen. So to make it clear, we have an ally in Ayutthaya now. So I think that is something that a story that has not been written in the history books of Myanmar and not been written in the history books of Bengal because you can see in the late 1630s, the Mughal administrative moved back the capital of Bengal from Dhaka to Rajmahal, much further inside, and in 1635, the Myanmar moved the capital from Pegu in the south up to Iwa. Now, I know there are other interpretations of this, but it's quite striking that at the same period, you see while Rakhine is going attacking, threatening, and invading, that there is an official political reaction. We move our capital out of this troubled area. Then there's one aspect of depopulating the areas, of selling off Bengali, of resettling people in Rakhine, but then also so many people that they would just like take and sell off into slavery. Slave market that was mainly run by the Portuguese captains, and in a way, they were, the Rakhine king are going to outsource slave raiding about that period. That's why when you're reading things about Arakan, when it comes from the Indian side, it's generally pointing they were basically all pirates and slave raiders, which is partly true. I won't get into detail of internal politics. There was a dynastic break in Rakhine, and there's a new king, a new dynasty, but this doesn't really weaken the throne. Now, I'm talking about these kings as lords of the Golden Palace because as much as all the kings that I mentioned were probably never in their palace because they were with their navy, all those kings after this period, they're mostly in their palace and not leaving anymore because they are threatened by neighbors, by competitors and rivals within the palace. It also didn't need much military invention because the system ruling the kingdom was basically balancing the existing political, economic, commercial network. It's during those years in the 1630s and 1640s and early 1650s that the Dutch East India Company is playing a huge part in terms of being a customer for the slaves, for the rice, and for the textiles produced mostly, the coarse textiles mostly produced in Chittagong. So this is, was an important role, and the Dutch sources about this people, a period, are also hugely important. This was an extremely rich kingdom. And Joost van der Helm, who was the representative of the Dutch East India, the chief in Mrau, and this guy knew something because he was living there. He went daily to the palace. He's talk, he's writing. In September 1644, the king had seven very precious Buddha statues made for a new pagoda he was planning to make. The statues were made of the purest gold, 
like about 13 kilos, and the stat this statue was beset with diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and pearls. The value of this statue was estimated at 100,000 tanka, the other six at 3,000 tanka each, and he goes on making such descriptions on a monthly basis, you see. And he ends by saying, the king ordered in July next year his treasurer again to distribute arms to the already extremely rich Buddhist monks. So this is a description, you see, from the inner life of this comb that accu accumulates uh, enormous wealth of which nothing today is left in any way. This is a representation in, in Schouten's uh, book and it gives some kind of faint idea about the landscape maybe how the city could have looked like or how one of these royal procession, processions took place that uh, have been described a couple of times by uh, people who, who visited Mrao during this time. So to summarize this, this is a story of mili uh, military aggression. It's a story of offensive strategy. It's a story of the naval strength of these fleets of several hundred and up to several thousand boats that can either defend or either play an aggressive uh, role. It's also a story of diplomacy because, as you have seen, they involve with Portuguese. They involved with Myanmar. They went to see the kings like Nau Pelouin, Talouin, the two major kings in the 17th century. They were talking and conversing with Mughal governors. Some of these correspondence exist still in Persia. The offensive military strategy, and I've pointed to two particular, particular uh, uh, striking moments in this history. In the end, you didn't need to fight. This was all about psychological warfare. And this is something that was lasting in the collective memory. Because in Bengali folklore, poetry in the 18th century, they're still talking about the Mak Harmat, the terror that these uh, fleets were, uh, uh, were spreading. And the British had actually a problem while they were invading Arakan in 1824 because they were not telling the soldiers, the Indian soldiers, where they would go. Because there was still this kind of threat hanging in the air of these people. Don't mess up with these people in Rakhine, in a way. But obviously, there was a risk to this. You know, when you depend on allies like the Portuguese, when you suddenly you don't need to fight, you might lack military preparedness, lack of foresight. But then talking again also, like kind of summarizing this diplomacy, I found it quite interesting to study these embassies that you see going along also spying, because it's basically spying. We know from Dutch sources that the Rakhine embassies who went to Java, so you see to Indonesia, they went that as far, they wanted just to check how many slaves actually do they need? How strong are the Dutch really? How important is this, you know? What, what kind of customer we have to do with, you know? They were all reporting back to the court while visiting these places. So this is all quite amazing, and the sources, Dutch sources are to unrivaled, you know, for the detail of this information. This led to strategic and tactical alliances. It's somewhat a pity that we don't have more on the Ayutian side in this, uh, in this case. I refer here, it's concerning both King Songdam and Passat Thong. Now, when you want to bring this to a map, you just look at it, you know Asia, you know the map of Asia, and you're just figuring out what that meant. You know the area where they could be active here along the coast. We have hard evidence, and it even went down to Tenasserim here, where there's a little bit less evidence, but there are very clear hints to it. I integrated here the Maldives Islands. Why? Because just like in Ayutthaya, they are using the cowrie shells as money. I mean, we see this here in the museum in Bangkok, and you find evidence, we have clear evidence, you know. Wouter Schouten is poking fun at it, and he said, when you go to the market in Rau, you have to take a big bag of cowrie shells, you know, to buy your vegetables and your, and your meat. So they're going down, we know uh, from early Portuguese descriptions that they were here in Aceh, they were definitely here, and I tried to distinguish a little bit what was trade network and what were the, uh, the diplomatic connections. I also put in here Sri Lanka with a yellow dot because we know that there were Buddhist monastic missions going from Rakhine to Sri Lanka, which obviously was, as you know very well, a holy land for, for Buddhists, you know, going to compare texts. No. Okay, this is kind of summarizing the whole view. Now we are moving into, because nothing lasts eternally, we're moving into the long period of decline of this kingdom. But we are into it 
with, and you see this is the only time that I put the name of a king in the title itself, King Sandatuda Mayasa, who reigned over 32 years. And I would like, <coughs> sorry, I would like to focus, sorry. And I would like to focus again on a more cultural aspect of this kingdom. Rakhine was indeed a cosmopolitan place, and you have one of the foremost poets of Bengali literature, who is mentioned in any history of Bengali literature, Alaol, who flourished at the court of Mrawu, and in his poetry is even praising the Buddhist king, and my colleague Thibaut Dubert, who's been working uh, so much on this poem over the last years, uh, is talking about secondary courts of the very educated people who are attending recitations of poetry there. Now, this Bengali poetry, and I would like to mention again here the publication, Thibaut's publication of his own research work on Alaol and the poetics in the shade of the Golden Palace, and he's talking about Mrawu and fitting in here a few more of these uh, really fine drawings that you find in, in, in Schouten's uh, publication. And at the same time that he is describing this poet living at the court of Mrawu, I can kind of see a re-emphasizes of Buddhist culturally belonging under this reign. And I would like to tell you why. First of all, I see it in the development of architecture, because when we are looking at the 15th, 16th century architecture, it's rather looking original with regard to these constructions that look much more like what you see in lower and even also in upper Myanmar. But more strikingly even, you find it here again, and I come back to the coins. You had here these trilingual coins. This is one from Yarazagri. And we move into, under theory, to the Mayasa, into uni, monolingual, one language coins. I think this is something, again, if this is striking, if this is significant, this is also, in a way, significant. And even more significant, I think, that suddenly all the titles systematically use the title of Dhammaraja. You're definitely referring to the Buddhist identity of these kings. Now, what had happened, what happened there during those years that leads us to this re-emphasizing Buddhist identity? Something went awfully wrong in Buddhist-Muslim relations. Now, some thing I'm moving into kind of a contemporary atmosphere by that, but it's true that large population of Rao was probably Muslim for the reason that many people had been deported to Rao for the one reason. But then there's a side story, another story that comes in, Shah Shuja, a Mughal prince, fighting a guy against his brother to conquer the Mughal throne has to run away, and has to run away very fast. He couldn't get the last boat to Mecca, where he wanted to go, and he ends up in the country of his enemy, in Araka. He was the governor of Bengal, the Rakhine way's enemy, for 30 years. So here he ends up in this kingdom. The king says, yes, you're welcome. And here they come with about four or 500 followers, and he sets court in Mrawu, or near Mrawu, in a place that people point to today. And then we don't know what went wrong. At one moment, Shah Shuja was killed in uncertain, in uncertain circumstances. But so many of the followers are there. There's a large Buddhist, uh, Muslim population. Something must have gone wrong. And it seems that there was an attempt for a putsch in 1663. The royal palace was set on fire. Riots broke out. The king had to intervene just to save the economic interest there, which was definitely more important than to see all these people clash against each other. And I think that was part of the reason that the court then was moving into a phase of thinking more about maybe its own identity. But this is largely speculation, so I leave it up to your own reflection. Definitely it set in court, it, it sent into move another mechanic. The Mughals got furious that one of their own was treated and mistreated and even killed. They sent an embassy to the court of Mrawu. The ambassador was instantly executed. That was not really a way to behave. 
They got mad at it. They said, we're going to trash them. We're going to invade this kingdom once again. That's what they did. But this time they did it in a more clever way. They prepared it a navy. But the most important fact is the Rakhine lost the support of their Portuguese allies. Chittagong was attacked by the Mughal governor, Shaista Khan. It was conquered. It was renamed Islamabad. And this was the beginning of the end. It was the end of a golden age. Because here, the kingdom was losing a large part of its income. A domestic crisis broke out. The garrisons ran back to Mrau, and it was possibly a free for all about all these wealth that had accumulated in the palace. 1784, look the dates here, it's about a century later. Myanmar is conquering Arakan. It becomes part of the Myanmar kingdom. And 40 years later, first Anglo-Burmese or Anglo-Myanmar war, and Arakan becomes the first province coming under the rule of the East India Company, running it from Calcutta. Uh, sorry, now here I need to push on this button. And I end up with a really beautiful map of Mau that was drawn by a British engineer in 1825. And you see once again, very much resembling to our maps of today, the Royal Palace site here in the middle, the populated sites, some of these areas still very much populated. But what's really interesting now for you are an hydrologist, a historian, or you are interested in aspects of the fortification, and you can go on the site and look what of these areas is still recognizable today. And that's what some of me and my colleagues were up to recently. Now, if I haven't already been talking for one hour, please bear with me for a few minutes. I would like to come to an end with Mrau, what we want to understand. I've tried to show you this unique history of a unique site, a Buddhist site, a cosmopolitan site, where there are many, many uh, aspects of culture that still need to be studied. But what we want to do is try to integrate the diverse information from different perspectives, combining what we see with what we can understand from the written sources and integrating of the new insights as well. Archaeological research is definitely going to play an important, an important part. The issue of naval construction, the issue of studying Buddhist art, Epigraphy is something where I personally feel I am involved trying to make a catalog of inscriptions. I've been involved for a long time in manuscript studies. Just like to mention that I've been looking for the oldest chronicle for 26 years now. I found it three months ago. As a student at the Department of Archaeology who found the oldest chronicle, that I, that I knew the name but I never could see it. So my work is carved out until retirement, believe me. There's still some mysterious sites also that are up. There's some rare drawings occasionally here, ships in Chittagong in an early 19th century British watercolor painting that I think is very interesting because Chittagong had a, a very peculiar type of Bengali naval architecture. Then there are sites like this, you see, where you think maybe a French garden architect of the 18th century had a word to say in this. But this is something, you know, where locals will tell us this was the Rakhine Parliament. I don't know. Or the Senate. Was it the Royal Council? Was it an abandoned palace site? We are still like kind of guessworking on what this is. Take, appreciate still the, the ridges, the hill, the plains, and hills, again, the earthen ramparts. And then there's this gorgeous architecture of the Pitakatai, what you call in Thai Hosamut, the places where you keep the canonical manuscript, the Pitaka, Tripidok. Uh, and, and this has not been yet described. You know, in some places, they are just merely the ruins that are kept. This is the one near the Chinkai wall, which means the, the mosquitoes are biting you. So this is a, a place easy to uh, memorize if you go and visit Mrau. And then the department is currently running in many sites, you know, destroyed, uh, not destroyed, but say ruins of pagodas. And always you can find like, like, like items uh, uh, that, that need to be treasured, that need to be studied in a much different way that has been done until today. And I'm getting back to one of my preferred sites, the Dokhan Teng, and you see what digital technology can bring to research by giving us a look inside and getting simply with our sense of viewing the sites inside these galleries here, 
narrow gallery outside, broad gallery inside, and it's pitch dark when you walk inside, unless you have a candle. Okay, there's electric light, unfortunately, but walking with a candle, it was a very peculiar place to, to go to. And this was the last picture of a statue within the Duke campaign. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Thank you, Jacques, very much. We have time for two or three concise questions. Uh, I just wondered whether, is there any evidence of Chinese records of this part of Myanmar? Because we know about Zhou Takuan who went to Angkor. And what about, you know, the Navy, Chang He, who went the maritime route up to almost up to Africa. So I wondered whether there is any Chinese records talking about this uh, kingdom. Not, not to my knowledge. I, I've been asking the question repeatedly, but not to my knowledge. I've been asking. Yeah. Uh, so this is a little aside. You, uh, as far as I can tell, you have a French name and a German name. Uh, where are you from? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Are you from Eastern France? No, I was born in Luxembourg. <laughs> can I ask a quick question? Okay. Um, until 1937, research on that part of Asia uh, was conducted, was under the supervision of the Archaeological Survey of India. And then from 1937 to 1948, independence, it was its own project. To what extent do you think the fact that it was governed from the British Raj, has that hampered, and to what extent, our knowledge of the area? Because it really was just a province of India as far as research was concerned. When you look at the report on the administration of Burma of 1887, I find a sentence, there's nothing of archaeological importance in Myanmar. What I want to say in terms of an answer is that the early understanding of people from the Archaeological Survey of India is that Burma is simply not relevant in terms of art. So all this was very slow to take off. And Mrau was really a very poorly visited site once the British were controlling the whole of Myanmar. You see that even a place like Pagan was not seen as very relevant in the, up to the, I don't know, maybe 1920s or 30s. Now, what is done is not research or excavation. What they are doing in the late 19th century in Mrau and in particular 1920s is restoration. And this depends on the locals. So the British administrators say, well, if there's some local interest, we might give some kind of funding for the restoration, but please, they should team up themselves. So this is also restoration and maintenance is really left to the locals in Arakan, in Rakhine. I know nothing about this at all, but I was just curious, uh, uh, trying to let me ask you a question. Uh, you suggest uh, you, have, you have said something about the Rakhine sending the fleet to somewhere selling slave. And where do they get the slave from the Rakhine people? And uh, now it's very curious because at that time in Southeast Asia, people were scarce, and uh, we know about how Ayutthaya, I mean, in, in, in Siam anyway, uh, and war is about taking people, and yet the Rakhine, oh, oh, are they selling off their own people somewhere else? And if that was the case, what made them so plentiful? Uh, thank you very much for this question, and sorry for not having paid sufficient attention to explain this. Um, 
What the Rakhine were doing is that they were depopulating the area north of Rakhine to create a kind of a buffer zone for any potential invaders from the Bengal side. The people they are deporting are Bengalis. And they are resettling them in the Kalada Valley. One of the reasons why the population there is increasing. So it's exactly the same thing like what you just recalled for Southeast Asia. Exactly the same thing. So they, they're taking these people from there. I was talking about the conquest of Pegu. They, according to the chronicle, they take 30,000 people from Pegu, from Hongsawadi, and take them up to Mrao. Until the 18th century, there was a Mon troop who had to take care about protecting the queen who was in Mrao. There is some memory about this. They were resettled in the northern part of the kingdom. And the Rakhine who live today in Bangladesh, they think that they are descendants of these Mon who were resettled there. So there are some more, you know, histories that spinning off this. So you ask me about slaves. The slaves are those that were not resettled. The Rakhine kings up to the 18th century were running and outsourcing in the same way. They were only keeping, let's say, the, 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 the able people, the qualified people, they kept. Like a poet for the court. The unqualified, they were selling off into slavery. Do we know anything about the military organization, the organization of people behind this extraordinary navy? Not really. No, not really. I mean, even the titles of the military ranks that we have in Rakhine, we just know the names. And the Dutch and Portuguese sources don't help. Getting back to the, the slaves issue, the, those who are transported to, let's say, Java, are there still, I mean, are there descendants around in Indonesia? Or do the communities still exist? Good question, but I don't think that. Uh, but they, I, I think they were resettled on these islands where the Dutch want to enforce the monopoly, you know, for spice production. That's all I could say about this. Uh, Jan Jacques, thank you so much. It looks like all of us have been waiting for decades for for your talk. Thank you very much for yeah. taking the time and being here being here tonight. And a token from appreciation.